Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Let me talk to you. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about in the land of sports. You are tuned in to the one and only sports edition of the ODPH, and we definitely like to keep those conversations rolling after the show. So, Pad, where does everybody go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Social media accounts, check. T Public Store link, check. Blog section, check. Classifieds, which has friends of the show, such as 3FM Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, and many more, check. The directory, which has us on how many providers, Pat? Uh, we are on 406,371. I do not question, folks. That is why he is a statistician to the stars. So make sure wherever you're listening to us on, drop a review on your favorite podcatcher. It definitely helps the algorithm of the show. Last but certainly not least, you want to check out the music section of the show where you hear such great bands as Brian Wolf and the Howlers, Shout of the Robots, Second Suitor, Tom Sholu, Floodlands. All the bands that provide music that you hear on the ODPH network is right there for you to download and take with you wherever you may travel. And for anything else that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That being said, let's kick it off like we always do during this time of year is NFL season. So, Pad, let's recap the week that was a week four. Yeah, so we're going to talk locks and leaps. We're going to start with one of my locks, and that was the Cincinnati Bengals to defeat the Carolina Panthers because, well, Carolina sucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they did with the final score being 34 to 24. Uh, Joe Burrow, 22 of 31, 232 yards passing, two touchdowns, just one interception. Uh, Andy Dalton, 25 of 40, 220 yards passing, two touchdowns, just one interception. Uh, Chuba Hubbard led the way for Carolina in rushing with 18 carries 104 yards rushing just one touchdown chase brown led the way for cincinnati with 15 carries 80 yards two touchdowns jamar chase led the way for cincinnati and receiving with uh, three catches 85 yards and one touchdown and for carolina it was deontay johnson seven catches 83 yards and one touchdown the biggest takeaway for me from this game is the Carol- or Carolina is a bad team, but the Bengals are right there with them you know what the- you know what though they're a bad team but they looked markedly better Then they did the last couple of weeks. And what does that say about Bryce Young? Oh, completely. Bryce Young, I think, unfortunately, is not ready for primetime. Nope. And that was something that we had a little worry when he came out of college, getting taken number one. It was a situation that he was going to get thrusted into the spotlight and Uh wasn't going to be ready for primetime. And unfortunately, it looks like he is not. Nope. So at least now he can have some time to learn behind Andy Dalton or wherever he may go in his career after this. Uh So Carolina is playing... Decent football. Yeah. I would say that's probably the nicest way to describe it. Yeah. And Cincinnati is playing arguably better, but... They bounce back. They bounce back, but they almost lost this game, too. Yeah. They did not look dominant in this game. Uh, What was it? It was 21 to 14 at mm-hmm. halftime. Right. Then it was only 7 nothing after the first. Yeah, so... It was not exactly a lights-out win for a team that a lot of us had penciled in to at least be in the AFC Championship game. Mm-hmm. There is a big disconnect still happening there, but I just can't figure out for the life of me what it is. Yeah. And I think maybe it's it's Jamar Chase's contract. That's the only thing I can really think of. Yeah, that's definitely, I think, affecting things. Yeah. I think that's the only thing that makes a lot of sense because you see this team and they should be putting up at least 35 points a game, but their their defense should be holding bad teams back. And they're not. I mean, I'm just looking at numbers here, especially for the receivers between Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. At this point in the season, numbers are down just because you look at Jamar Chase, 19 catches, 300 yards, and three touchdowns. He's averaging 15.8 uh, yards a catch. Mm-hmm. And then for T. Higgins, he's got nine catches on the year, 99 yards, and no touchdowns. And he's averaging 11 yards a catch. Yeah. So, so, like, that's – now, I'm not expecting, you know, Randy Moss on Thanksgiving Day level numbers, but still, for those guys at this point in the season, yeah, it's, that's a little down. It's a little down, but it's something to be a little pause for concern because this team is used to putting up big numbers. Mm-hmm. This team is used to imposing their will. Mm-hmm. You have to figure that something is wrong, and it clearly is a disconnect, whether it's Joe Burrow, whether it's his wide receivers. I think it's the receivers because, I mean, I'm looking at Burrow. 
978 yards passing, seven touchdowns, one interception, and a quarterback rating of 70.8. So that, that, and considering he's coming off of injury, that's not bad. It's not bad, but still, for where we expect this team to be, yeah. they're underperforming. And they got a, a desperate win they needed. I'm not saying they're back by any oh, stretch no. by any stretch of the imagination. They God, play no. they have to really go on a win streak to win me over. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this team is going to do it in their f- current form. Eh. And I think it's going to be a long run seeing where they go from here. We will see. Uh, for the Carolina Panthers, they have got the Chicago Bears coming on Sunday. They're going up to uh, yeah, up to Chicago. After that, week 13, at home against the Atlanta Falcons, week seven. Uh, they are on the road playing the Washington Commanders. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, and then week eight, they're on the road playing the Denver Broncos. For the Cincinnati Bengals, this upcoming Sunday, they are at home against the Baltimore Ravens. Then they're on the road uh, on Sunday Night Football playing the New York Football Giants. Week seven, they're on the road playing the Cleveland Browns. And then week eight, they are at home against the Philadelphia Eagles. How soon can they start flex scheduling? Uh, I can look it up. Because I'm thinking that Giants-Bengals game, that could get moved if it's in that time period. I can't. I think it's week nine they can do that. So we'll have to check and see what, what applies here. Yeah. But I have to say, if, if that's going to be a primetime showing, the Bengals have to get it together. I don't know necessarily with that schedule. I mean, the Giants should be an easy win per mm-hmm. se, but – Baltimore, not so much, and you see where everything is going from here. It's a good bounce-back win, nevertheless, so they should definitely rally around that. Mm -hmm. But for anything moving forward or anybody that's announcing the Bengals are back, I think you're sadly mistaken. Uh, So so according to NFL.com, quote, for Sunday Night Football, it may be used up to twice between weeks 5 and 10 and at the NFL's discretion during weeks 11 through 17. For Monday Night Football, it may be used at the NFL's discretion in weeks 12 through 17. And for Thursday Night Football, it may be used up to twice between weeks 13 and 17. Yeah, typically they don't wind up moving games that early in the season. I think they've done it maybe once or twice before. Yeah. But I'm thinking with how bad the Bengals are looking and with the Giants, yeah, that could be the first time we really see something get moved. Could be. But we'll have to wait to see how it goes play out. Could be. Uh, and then it took one of my leaves because I could not believe this team was an underdog. Uh, and that was the Las Vegas Raiders to beat the Cleveland Browns, which they did by the final score of 20-16. to 16. Gardner Minshew, 14-24, 130 yards passing, no touchdowns or interceptions. Uh, Deshaun Watson, 24-32, 176 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Jerome Ford led the way for Cleveland in rushing, 10 carries, 58 yards, no touchdowns. Alexander Mattinson led the way for Las Vegas with five carries, 60 yards, no touchdowns. Jacoby Myers led the way for uh, the Raiders in receiving with five catches, 49 yards, no touchdowns. And then Jerry Judy led the way for Cleveland in receiving six catches, 72 yards, and no touchdowns. But, of course, that's not the big news with this. Big news, of course, coming today. Uh, Devontae Adams looking to get out of Vegas. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going around about this. Like, I think he said he'd be open to leaving. I don't think Mm -hmm. he was demanding a trade by any means. But the problem the Raiders have is Gardner Minshew is obviously not the future of the franchise. Mm -hmm. They need to upgrade at that position. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it did not happen this season. Uh, according to Adam Schefter, uh, the Raiders have informed teams they would consider, yeah. in quotes, trading three-time uh, All-Pro receiver Devontae Adams. Uh, basically, I guess what they're looking for is a package that would include a second-round draft pick and additional compensation. Well, that would make sense. I think, yeah. I think at this stage, I mean, Devontae Adams is still a name. Is he is he a top five wide receiver? Mm. I mean, he's in the discussion, but yeah. I think I just think unfortunately, as in great, he has not had great quarterback play to get him there. <laughs> I think the team that's probably the most interested in connecting with him, if they could pull it off, is the Jets. Yep, that was but, the first thought I had. Oh yeah, which would make a ton of sense because the Jets' offense is underperforming. Allegedly, they wanted him before. Oh yeah, they've allegedly they've coveted him for quite some time. Yeah. So that being said, I wouldn't doubt them pulling it off. But then again, what do they have to offer? Yeah, that that is the that is the ultimate question. Yeah, and that's something that I don't think they have enough assets to do. But I could be wrong, and you know, magic has happened sometimes, or you know, surprisingly or not. Yeah, it's one of those weird theories that you have to kind of just put in perspective about it. That it does he really want out of Vegas, or is he just frustrated with the quarterback play? Mm-hmm. Which he could make an argument for. I mean, Minshew's numbers not great: fourteen for twenty-four, a buck thirty, mm-hmm. zero and zero. I mean, that's not exactly lighting up any stat line. No. And for a team that should be contending now with that defense, mm-hmm. it's just not happening the way I think it should be. So, where do you go from here? Moving Adams, I mean, that's saying full rebuild. Yeah. Because you really have a young team, and I don't know exactly who you have to really step up and say. 
this is your number ones. I mean, arguably right now, just without looking at I don't know years and whatnot. I think Jacoby Myers without Devonta Adams there might be the most seasoned receiver on that team. Oh, certainly, because I, I think you have Brock Bowers, but he's in, he's a first round draft pick. Yeah. So I mean, what are you going to do there? I mean, you got Jacoby Myers, Trey Tucker, Harrison Bryant, ba- Brock Bowers, DJ Turner, uh, Mattinson, and Zamir White all had catches on Sunday. Yeah. So it makes for a, a good argument to see about what the future is with the Raiders. But we knew that this was going to be a problem with the quarterback situation. Like, Minshew is a stop gap uh-huh. to get you to the next player. I just don't know who that is. I think that maybe, just maybe, they underestimated the draft this year. But then again, when um, Atlanta took their quarterback in the first uh, top ten there uh, with Michael Penix there, yeah. that yeah. threw everybody off. So I think the Raiders were eyeballing him, and they didn't get him and didn't have yeah. a plan B. So. I ju- I, and I did look through the guys who caught – catches on Sunday Jacoby Myers is currently the most uh uh seasoned core uh, receiver on that team by I think two years well that's why I think the Raiders will listen to offers and it's, and it's not much it's six years yeah but the Raiders will listen to offers oh, I mean, yeah I mean they would be smart too yeah I don't think they move them though ultimately unless you're, you're not gonna get a King's ransom part you'll get a decent haul you well you can get something for Adams but depending on what the team is yeah and you have to think about who really needs a number one the Jets obviously yeah, do. yeah yeah Buffalo could be a dark horse in this. Yeah, I, don't, I don't. Pittsburgh maybe. I don't think they move. Pittsburgh would be one, but I don't know if they want to go for any kind of real big trades. They usually don't. They yeah, just, they're more known to build through the draft. You have to take a look at some teams out west. That could be a situation there. Oh, there's one I thought about. It'll never happen. Hmm. Kansas City. Well, Kansas City is in talks for another receiver. I heard allegedly, and that is somebody out of Miami coming back home. Oh. I have heard some talk. Interesting. Of, I have heard some rumblings. Now, granted, I'm putting the allegedly by this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying this is fact, but with the current situation in Miami, I've heard that Tyreek Hill's name has been talked about huh. getting moved. Huh. And Kansas City, since obviously Rasheed Rice right. is out for the – it sounds like he's out for the year. He's got to be out for the year. Yeah, with a, well, I believe it's a torn ACL. I don't know if the official word came out. If he's gone, yeah, I see them making a move for somebody. Now, the only thing is I don't see the Raiders doing business with the Chiefs under any circumstance. Yeah, well, that's why I had the thought, and then I immediately, before I even said anything, went, yeah, no, that's never going to happen. Right. They would not do that. Hell would freeze over first. Right. But that's why I say I could see Adams getting moved somewhere out east in a way, but unless they want to go NFC West, where that's where I was thinking, like, you could try doing something along the lines of the L.A. Rams, Mm -hmm. who have been a surprise team. I could see that working. Because obviously they have a need at wide receiver, right? Or you can try taking your chances about going in to the, to the central division teams. So update from Adam Schefter on Rasheed Rice. Uh, he tweeted this yesterday as we record. "Quote: After further testing on Rasheed Rice's knee today, there remains uncertainty over the extent of his injury. Per sources, after consulting with team doctors and receiving second opinions, more tests are required to determine the full extent of Rice's injury and his recovery timeline. No answers are expected until next week." Well, like I say, I will do the unofficial armchair doctor, and I'm saying he's out for the year. Yeah. And I think Kansas City is going to be definitely looking to make a move. I just don't see him doing business with the Raiders. No. Not not, not this current Raiders organization. No, there, there's say. no way. So we'll have to wait to see about that, but it was a good win for them. And Cle- Absolutely. And Cleveland, the only thing you can say is Deshaun Watson is not the Deshaun Watson of old. He uh, looks old. 727 yards on the season, four touchdowns, three interceptions, and a quarterback rating of 23.7. Yeah, he's definitely Yikes. underperforming at, at all can be. Nick Chubb still not being in that backfield hurts them tremendously. I don't think it would help much. But I agree with you. I think that's the problem. I think Deshaun Watson, I know a lot of teams were looking at him when he came back. So I don't blame the Browns for going for the thought that he would be the Deshaun Watson from Houston on the field. Oh, sure. So I can't blame them on it, but I think at this point you have to start looking at other options. If, if, If I'm the Cleveland GM at that point in time, you know, and I need a quarterback. I need a, and I'm just looking at the numbers, and I'm looking. Oh, sure. And, and I'm looking at the footage from Deshaun Watson in his time in Houston. I'll, listen, I'll take a flyer on it. Yeah, sure. Obviously, it came back to bit him in the butt, but you know that's that's part of the game. I can't fault him on it. No. The only thing I fault is the contract. But that was a lot of yes. money. That was a lot of money to get him. I dare you to find somebody who was happy with that contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, for these two teams, the next couple weeks for the Cleveland Browns, this upcoming Sunday, they are on the road playing the Washington Commanders. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, then they go on the road playing the Philadelphia Eagles. 
Then they got the uh, Cincinnati Bengals at home in week seven. And then week eight, they are at home against the Baltimore Ravens. For the Las Vegas Raiders this upcoming Sunday, they are on the road playing the Denver Broncos. Uh, Week six, they are at home against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Week seven, on the road playing the Los Angeles Rams. Week uh, And then week eight, uh, at home against... The Kansas City Chiefs. I will say this: their season lies on Week Eight. Yep. That that's I I guarantee you that locker room has that date circled. Uh huh. So we'll have to wait to see how it plays out we from there. Shall. Next up, we've got my pick, and this is I, I'm surprised. I'm shocked at this. Mm-hmm. That's why it kind of takes me a little while to realize like this actually happened. But the Philadelphia Eagles have fallen off mm-hmm. and fallen off badly. Mm-hmm. And I'm not exactly sure where you point blame to. I'm not sure where you can start. But there is a big, big disconnect going on between the team and their head coach. Mm -hmm. Pat, let's get into it. So uh, you had picked the Philadelphia Eagles beat this Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which did not happen because the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won 33-16. Baker Mayfield, 30-47, 347 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Jalen Hurts, 18-30 for 158 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Saquon Barkley led the way for Philly in rushing with 10 carries, 84 yards, and just one touchdown. Uh, Bucky Irving led the way for Tampa Bay with 10 carries, 49 yards, and one touchdown. Rashad White also had the exact same stat line, just minus one uh, touchdown. Uh, the only So the only difference between those two guys is one touchdown and about two yards uh, on their longest run. Kind of bizarre. Hmm. Uh, for Tampa Bay in receiving, it was Mike Evans with eight, car- eight catches, 94 yards, one touchdown. And for Philly, it was Dallas Goder with seven catches, 62 yards, and no touchdowns. Like I said, this is a shocking score. Yeah, Philadelphia should be playing a lot better, and they're not. Mm-hmm. There is a, a something is not clicking right there between the head coach and Jalen Hurts. You can definitely tell on the field it's not working. Uh, this team is a shell of itself. Yeah, and sure, you can say, well, Tampa Bay is playing a lot better than teams give them credit for, mm-hmm. and I will agree with that. But at the same time, when your team is built to win now, you are a Super Bowl contender right now. Mm-hmm. Letting Tampa Bay outscore you in that first half 24 to 7 mm-hmm. is mind-blowing i mean i think the the disconnect with this has got to be I, a the defensive changes we talked last week mm-hmm. where they've got the did that for whatever reason they decided to part with their defensive coordinator from last season brought the new guy in clearly that ain't working this season i mean i'm just looking at their stats okay they they won 34 29 uh, against Green Bay. Okay, but you gave up 29 points. Mm-hmm. Lost to Atlanta 22-21. Okay, so you gave up another 22. Yeah, uh, you beat it New Orleans 15 to 12. Okay. Not as bad. You get but you, you gave up 12. Yeah. And then you lost just lost to Tampa Bay 33-16, so you gave up 33. The other issue I'm, I'm seeing is I'm looking at the depth chart here. They're hurting on the offensive side of the ball. Okay, mm-hmm. you got Saquon Barkley who's doing very well for himself all things considered. You look at the wide receiver core. AJ Brown out. Johnny Wilson, questionable. Uh, Britton Covey, IR. Devontae Smith, out. Paris Campbell, nothing wrong with him. And then Jacob Harris, IR. Then you got the other wide receiver, Jahan Dotson, who played on Sunday, although he only had like two catches for 11 yards. Okay, fine. And then you got Anias Smith, IR. So out of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight guys, you've got two of them are out, three of them on, are on, on IR, and one of them's questionable. Jalen ain't got nobody to throw to. Yeah, they have to really rely on the run game, but I think this is where it comes down to the defense, though. Well, yes, also the de- the defense is Yeah, the too. defense can't get a pass on this one because they are not playing up to their potential. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's where I say I think this comes down to the coaching, and I think that there's going to be a lot of questions being asked about Sertani's future. Mm, Sirianni, or yeah. Sirianni, I should say. I apologize. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of questions – Going I think, on with that. No, I agree. I think you might have to look at defensive coordinator first just because I don't necessarily put this fully on the offense and Jalen Hurts. Jalen's got nobody to fucking throw to. When when you're when I'm looking at the box score here and for his receivers, okay, Dallas Godare, Saquon Barkley, Grant Calatera, uh Calcaterra, excuse me, Paris Campbell, Yahan Dotson, John Ross, Jack Stoll, Kenneth Gainwell, and Johnny Wilson. Out of out of Godare and Barkley, have you ever heard of any of those guys? No. Exactly. So I don't put this on Saquon, or not Saquon, uh, Jalen. Listen, he might not be having the best offensive game 
but he doesn't have anybody to fucking throw to. This is this is more on the defense, and clearly, you, you look at what, how the defense was last year. Mm-hmm. One of the best up until that, you know, end of the regular season collapse, you know, and that you look at what it is this season. Night and day difference. Oh, completely. So I think it, it's you got to start with the defensive coordinator. And is it early? Sure, but do you want to save your season? You might need to. Well, I think after they come off the bye this week, they really got to take a look at some chances and see what yeah. they can do. Yeah. On the flip side, though, Tampa Bay. I don't think any of us had penciled to start three and one. Although the feud between Baker Mayfield and Tommy Brady never had never saw that coming. Did not have that on my bingo yeah. card, and I will just advise Mr. Mayfield. Do not go into this bout with Mr. Brady. I mean, and and, and for the, the the teammates who were there with Brady in Tampa Bay, did y'all not know what you were getting into when he came down there? He is famous for being that kind of way. Yep. So they have to remember that and make sure to keep that in yeah. context. But that's why Brady is who Brady is. And mm-hmm. Baker is, a freak. is on his third team now. So yeah. just saying it is what it yeah. is. Yeah, but, it listen, is. but Baker should be happy about it. Yeah. Where he is. I mean, at now. if we're gonna falter, critique Tampa Bay in any way, I mean, the run game's not great. Never has been for quite some time. True. So, so since it's what Cadillac Williams. I mean, arguably, yeah, was like 2006. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely make some arguments there, but I think that yeah. they've been known as a very pass happy yeah. offense. Yeah, and they've been making do with what they got. So, good win for them, and let's we'll see where they go from here. By the way, just to twist the knife in Giants fans, how about Sterling Shepard, three for fifty one? Oof, that ain't bad. Oof, Not oof, bad. Oof, oof, Sorry, had to go there. Uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles, as we alluded to, they're on a bye this upcoming week, but they come out of the bye uh, week six at home against the Cleveland Browns. So, uh, Sunday, week seven, they're on the road playing the New York football giants. And then week eight, they are <clears throat> excuse me, on the road playing the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this upcoming Sunday, or excuse me, this upcoming Thursday, uh, they are on the road playing Atlanta. That's uh, it'll be on Prime Video. Uh, week six, they are on the road playing the New Orleans Saints. Week seven, Monday Night Football against the Baltimore Ravens. And then week uh, eight at home against the Atlanta Falcons. They got a lot of divisional games coming up the next month. Holy, yeah, holy they cow. definitely pack that schedule for that. So yes, they did. Interesting to see where their destiny takes them from here. Yeah. And then my other leap, which I have to say, I'm, I'm going to start taking a victory lap a little early here. Okay. I have taken in our locks and leaps competition, which you can find on all social media, that Washington was going to be a lot better than people thought, and they were going to steal some games, and yet they are doing that with a record now of 3-1. and one. Uh, Yep. Because they did what to the Cardinals, Pat? Beat the holy hell out of them by the tune of 42-14. to 14. Yep. Uh, Jaden Daniels, 26-30, 233 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Kyler Murray, 16-22, 142 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Uh, James Conner for Arizona led the way, 18 carries, 104 yards rushing, one touchdown. Brian Robinson Jr., 21 carries, 101 yards, one touchdown. Is that 50 cent many men I hear playing in the background? I think so. Uh, for Washington and receiving, uh, Olamide Zacchaeus led the way with six catches, 85 yards, no touchdowns. And for Arizona, surprise, surprise, Marvin Harrison Jr. led the way with five catches, 45 yards, one touchdown. Jalen Daniels is playing like he should have been the number one pick. Playing like an actually halfway decent uh, Heisman Trophy winner in the NFL. Mm-hmm. When's the last time we had that? I was going to say, he is playing like the front-running candidate for Rookie of the Year. Oh, I, he is in my book. I know it's early, but we have to take a look now. One month into the season. His only loss is Tampa Bay. Yeah. He is playing at such a high level, even against the Giants, who yeah. that was a test because we've always talked about divisional games. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Daniels is playing very composed. He's playing yeah. very solid. I mean, starting out from that Tampa Bay loss, they've now won three in a row. They've won gritty, except for this week, which was a blowout. Mm-hmm. And to see him emerge in this role is huge. Yeah, uh, even even in the loss, 20 points in the loss to Tampa Bay, came back against the Giants, beat them 21-18, came back against the Bengals, beat them 38-33, to uh, and then this Arizona game, 42. And for the season, he has 897 yards passing, good for 12th in the NFL. Uh, three touchdowns, which is tied for 24th, and then one interception, which is tied for 26th in the NFL. And he's got a quarterback rating. Listen to this. 73.3. Wow. Good for fourth overall in the NFL. Those, like, those are good stats. Yeah, like I said, he's playing lights out right now. And for Washington, this is a time to really celebrate because 
as of right now, you have found the missing piece to your puzzle that you've been waiting for for quite some time. Yeah. Daniels is the real deal. Uh, yeah, he is. And you're getting him weapons around him that are stepping up. And, and the one thing I like is, even though, I mean, Zach Hurts we know, Scary Terry yeah. we know. Noah Brown, familiar, I've heard the name. Right. They're not superstars, no. and he's spreading the ball out. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, okay, Zacchaeus is 6 for 85, but then you got Terry McLaurin, 7 for 52. Noah Brown, 3 for 26. Zach Ertz, 3 for 22. Uh, Luke McCaffrey, 1 for 17. Brian Robinson Jr. receiving, 3 for 12. You know, even uh, John Bates, 1 for 9. Jeremy Nichols, uh, uh, McNichols, excuse me, 1 for 6. Diami uh, Brown, 1 for 4. So, like... The ones aren't anything sexy, but that still shows. He got we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine receivers in the mix. Yeah, and, so, and they all caught at least one ball. Mm-hmm. So he's understanding how about spreading the ball out. This team is playing very solid as a team. The fact that they dropped forty two on an Arizona team, which is not as yeah. bad as their record would say per se. No, they've they've had a rough schedule at the start. Oh yeah, but. They have a lot to work on. I mean, I don't think anybody had them really penciled to make a run. No, I figured people figured they might do better than they did last season, you know, where they were top five, top three uh, draft pick in the NFL. But, I mean, like you said, their record doesn't really play to how bad they are just because, I mean, you look at who they played, Buffalo week one, Rams week two, Lions week three. Yeah. Yikes. It's a rough start. Oh, it is. So we'll have to see how they do panning out from here. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, this upcoming Sunday, they're on the road playing the San Francisco 49ers. Ooh, Division Two. Week after that, they go on the road and play Green Bay up in Green Bay. Hmm. Week seven, they're at home against the Los Angeles, Char- uh, Los Angeles Chargers. That could go either way. That's a Monday night game, by the way. Uh, and then week eight, they're on the road playing the Miami Dolphins, which start of the season, I said, might be rough for them. Now it's honestly a toss up. Yeah, we will see for the Washington Commanders this upcoming Sunday. They're on the road playing the Cleveland Browns or yeah, excuse me. They're at home playing the Cleveland Browns uh, week six. They're on the road playing the Baltimore Ravens week seven uh, at home against the Carolina Panthers. And then week eight. I think if anything gets flexed, if it can get flexed at this point, it might be this one. Uh, week eight is uh, the Washington Commanders against the Chicago Bears. They might keep that where it is. Oh, you're talking about what time is that game supposed to be? At? One o'clock. Oh, they might flex that. They might flex that to four, one of the four o'clock. Yeah, they they might mess around with that. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels. I was going to say one versus two. They, yeah. they, might, they might do that. That's what I'm so. saying. If anything gets flexed there, might be that one. But right now, I mean, Daniels is leading that draft class, and he is sending a very, very high benchmark. So yes, he is. We'll have to wait to see if he can keep this up. That being said, let's take a quick lap around the league for the rest of the games, yeah. Pat. And one that, I mean, we have to, be, because of contract reasons, have to talk about. We are contractually obligated, and that was the Thursday night game that took place between the uh, Dallas Cowboys, who defeated those those uh, New York football giants by the final score of 20-15. to 15. Um, This was really a bad game. I'm, yeah. I'm glad for Dallas fans that they won, because it, had they lost, it would have been even worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say this is not a game that uh, – Giants fans, I know you guys don't have anything nice to say about it. I'm not going to just keep piling on about it. But this was bad. Dallas won. Take that as a win, Cowboys fans. I'll add this because i got to keep this in mind for all future uh, locks and leaps. And, hell, I'll throw a parlay in on this. Uh, Daniel Jones, in his career on Thursday night, 0-6. I believe it. Law, uh, 2019, lost to the Patriots. 2020 lost to the Eagles, 21 lost to the Washington, 2022 lost to Dallas, 2023 lost to San Francisco, and then they had the Dallas game. So, yeah, this happened. Yeah, I mean, easiest way to describe it with Dallas fans, yep. a solid win, and I mean, one game in back of the uh, the Commanders. Who would have thought we would say that? I know. Uh, then you had the Atlanta Falcons defeat the New Orleans Saints, 26-24. Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta stole one here. Atlanta's got a fucking lights out kicker. Yeah. On the season for field goals. Field goal percentage, 100%. Extra point percentage, 100%. This dude don't miss. Of course, I say that now he's going to miss his next game. But oh, probably. Well, I remember before he got there, he was missing a lot. So mm-hmm. maybe it's just a change of scenery is, is, Could be. is doing the gentleman some Could good. Be. Could be. But I would say if it wasn't for a mishandled punt, the game would have gone <laughs> completely the other way, and yeah. the Saints would have locked that in. Yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, they did not. Nope. Uh, you had the Chicago Bears defeat the L.A. Rams by the final score of 24-18. to 18. have to admit, I was very surprised at this one. Yeah. I did not see the Rams 
uh, losing. Seth Rollins loved it. Yeah, I was going to say, well, the Bears had to start winning sometime. I mean, mm-hmm. the, Caleb Williams, what are you going to get out of him? Not a sexy stat line, 17-23, uh, 157-1. and one. Not bad. Right. But I think for the Rams, it was a little puzzling because they had been playing very solid mm-hmm. prior to. Matthew Stafford, who, I mean, if you want to talk about trading somebody, I think the Raiders still should take that look and see about maybe moving him out of L.A. It would not hurt at this stage. No. If you want to keep Devontae Adams, that's the move you make. Also, hey, uh, L.A., did your run defense decide to take the night off? Uh, they did. They did completely. Good Lord. It was a long game. Yep. Uh, then you had the Minnesota Vikings defeat the Green Bay Packers 31-29. Let's be honest about this. Green. I think we need to have an honest conversation. Okay. Minnesota is the best team in football right now? Uh, arguably. 4-0 and right now. Who would have thought that outside of Minnesota? Uh, we know a couple people who are Vikings fans that even they would not have thought this. No, oh, completely not. Gritty win for Sam Darnold, who <sighs> things I thought I would not be saying in 2024 is making a run for MVP and a way too early discussion. No, uh, completely. But like I say, it's one month in. No, and, I know, and this no, is what we have. But I know. he is playing at a very elite level. Jordan Love returned to the lineup, though not the greatest stat line: thirty-two for fifty-four. Yeah, three eighty-nine, three. four touchdowns, but three interceptions. Yeah, yikes! That that's the telling point. So Minnesota played lights out, mm-hmm. and uh, like I say, I saw on first take. I've seen a couple other places they penciled the number one team in football, and it's uh, it's hard pressed not to make that argument. They're not winning pretty, but they're winning. Well, we'll see what happens Sunday. Sunday they are technically at home. Uh, against the New York Jets, but it's across the pond. It's over in Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Oh, okay. Oh, so the one of the London games. Uh, next up, you had the Indianapolis Colts defeat the Pittsburgh Steelers 27-24. Surprised at this outcome. Yeah. I thought when Anthony Richardson went down that they would not be able to pull this off. But Joe Flacco is finding ways to do it. Uh-huh. And I will say in the press conference after in the locker room, Najee Harris said something I really I applaud him for. Okay. One reporter uh, that was talking to him was saying was questioning about Justin Fields' play. Sure. And Harris immediately shut him down and said, why are you throwing the focus on one player? Right. Paraphrasing. He's yeah. like, this is a team game. Yeah. We lost. Yep. Not Justin lost. Yep. And immediately drove that point home, and I just want to applaud that because you don't hear that often a lot in pro sports. No. And – Najee had it right on the head. Agreed. The, we've said Indianapolis is the most boring team in football. They're not gonna. Yeah. They're not gonna like win any kind of high scoring a, a game. But when Jonathan Taylor's in that backfield, he's still giving them problems, or he's still gonna be a problem for a lot of teams. Pittsburgh definitely just did not. They ran out of chances. That's mm-hmm. the only way you could describe yeah. it. So it's yeah. not really on Fields playing bad because I don't think he did. No. But I think for Indianapolis, they, they won ugly. And this is the only way you can describe it, but being 2-2 two and two at this stage, I think it's still a win. No, I mean, if, if Fields 22-34, 312, and one touchdown. You, the only, like, you want to call it a blemish, he got sacked four times, but that uh, that's more on the offensive line than Fields. Oh, completely. Um, two things. One, uh, Anthony Richardson currently, as we record, is listed as uh, questionable, uh, in quote, uh, Richardson is considered day to day with oblique and abdominal strains per Tom Pelissero of the NFL network, which as someone who strained his oblique twice, shit hurts mm-hmm. and it's a pain in the ass Two, shout out Joe Flacco for the quote of the weekend with the, the comment about, uh, him being eight days older than Anthony Richards, Richardson's mom. Yeah. Hilarious quote. Joe Flacco still got a sense of humor. Still got it. Love it. Uh, then you had the Denver Broncos defeat the New York Jets. 10 to 9. Barn burner of a score. Oh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we have to talk about it. Uh, listen, I'll just be quick. Uh, Bo Nix, mm-hmm. uh, good win for him. Not the sexiest stat line, but shit, he won. He won. That's the only thing you can say. I mean, it was horrible weather down at, yeah. at the Jets Stadium. Yeah. But if you can say you beat Aaron Rodgers, that's a feather in the cap. Yeah. So you got to take that as a win. I mean, listen, the weather, as Aaron Rodgers said on Pat McAfee show today, stereotypical New York weather, which, yeah, he's not wrong. Oh, he's not wrong at all. But I think when your team is not playing well, I mean, the, no. the Denver shut down Brees Hall. Yep. And once you take him out of the equation, you're asking Rodgers to step it up. And with that wide receiver core, which, I mean, let's face it. Nothing sexy. It's. I think it's underperforming in my in my humble opinion. Brees Hall, ten carries, four yards. 
Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, I mean, the stats aren't bad, but it's just it's not really lighting anything up. Mike Williams, four for 67. Alan Lazard, five for 58. Garrett Wilson, five for 41. Tyler Conklin, uh, four for 17. Brees Hall, two for 14. Braylon Allen, one for 12. Jeremy Ruckert, two for 10. And then Xavier Gibson, one for six. Yeah. Nothing right home about no. here, but like I say, Bo Nix, good win for him. Maybe he'll boost some confidence. I'll yeah, be though yeah, yeah. throwing for sixty yards. Uh, not exactly a stat to be proud. Got a field about. for the kicker though, Greg uh, Zuerlin. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, missed that kick late. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, then you had the let's see the uh, Houston Texans beat the Jacksonville Jaguars twenty four to twenty. Jacksonville's a hot mess. Jacksonville's zero and four. They are a mess. I mean, there's a disconnect between Peterson and that team. That is a real one. I, I I can't remember the exact quotes that were coming out of it, but if if true, yeah, there's problems. Maybe maybe they can invoke uh, the rule, invoke a rule or a special request that for the first twenty minutes their records on the line. I mean, that's a possibility. <laughs> knowing <laughs> knowing their ownership, I mean, maybe that might happen. Oh boy! But the only thing I I think that's real notable about this game is Christian Kirk, seven catches, sixty one yards, and a touchdown. That's not bad. Not bad. But for Houston, I mean, it's division, so yeah. they. I I think that Stroud, hell of a game, twenty seven forty three forty five and two. Yeah, he played Woo. well. He played well. Woo. So it's gonna be a Nico a, Collins uh, fantasy owners. How are you feeling? Yeah, twelve for one hundred and fifty one. Yikes! Did not expect that out of out of him for this no. game, but it is what it is. No, yeah. Houston playing good, especially that they're going to need to build that momentum because they got the Bills coming up next week. Uh, then you had the Kansas City Chiefs defeat the L.A. Chargers seventeen to ten. Of course, the story as we alluded to with this one, Patrick Mahomes doesn't know how to throw a block. No, he doesn't. Well, he does, but just on the wrong guy. No, and I think for Chiefs fans, uh, some fears were put aside. Travis Kelsey actually had a game. Someone must have sent him the link to our po- episode last week. Yeah, I think so too. It's rumored he has it, so I don't know. So right. we'll have to find out. So, Trav, if so, we, we can talk on the show. We'll, we'll more more than entertain. Hook that. us up with an interview with your brother. I love yeah. love to interview his brother. Yeah, we'd love to talk, to Jason. Yeah. But that being said, the Chiefs got this one given to them because yeah, huh? the Chargers did the Chargers things. Yeah. The most inconsistent team in football decided to get ins- inconsistent in the second quarter. Not even the second half. I was going to say, yeah, not, not even the second half, second quarter. No, they they went away from the game plan from whatever they were doing. They were trying to force too much, and they got no pressure on Patrick Mahomes, and he was having their way with them. And the fact that they, he just went back to what he knew best, and that was literally throw the ball to Kelsey. Well, and, and the defense, too, just because you just, if you just look at the first quarter, 10 0 uh, Los Angeles after the first quarter. Kansas City put up the entirety of its final score in quarters two, three, and four. Mm-hmm. Seven in the second, three in the third, seven in the fourth. So offensively, they went away from the game plan. Defensively, they went away from the game plan. And j- why? Well, the thing is, Steve Spagnola still made up a, gr- a great second half uh, adjustment. Yeah. And, and he shut down Herbert. I mean, Herbert was trying, but. 16 the- 27, 179, and one. Yeah, but when it came down to being three and outs and big outs. Mahomes was converting. Yeah. So you you got to give the devil his due. They won ugly, and especially driving the ball down late in the fourth. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they they did what they needed to do, so you can't fault them on that. No. I'll, be, I'll be at the other Rice Rice situation is the one we're going to keep an eye on. They're, they're hurting at wide receiver. Yeah, that's why I say I am not doubting we don't have a possible Tyreek Hill trade. Could be. We don't. I'm going to put it out there right now. I think that does happen. Because, I mean, you look at the wide receiver core. Rasheed Rice, he's done, He's listed it out. He's done for the year. Sorry, is what it is. But you got Juju Smith-Schuster, who on the season has two catches, 17 yards, and one touchdown. We're a month into the season, folks. You've got uh, Sky Moore, who has no catches, no yards, and no touchdowns. So, dude has not literally caught a thing. Uh, you've got Hollywood Brown, who's on IR. You've got Xavier Worthy, who's got nine catches, 154 yards, and two touchdowns. So, not bad, but also rookie. Uh, and then you've got Jaron Hayek, who's on IR. Uh, you've got Justin Watson, who let's pull up his stats. Six catches, 87 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, and then you've got McCole Hardman, who has, pull these up, uh, nothing. Uh, I'm not, Literally no stats for the season, so Lord knows what he's been doing. So literally your only offense you've got right now that's even halfway decent is Xavier Worthy and tra- uh, Travis Kelsey. Mm-hmm. Good luck. Yeah, so I think they're, they're going to be making some moves. Like I said, the issue... 
is Kansas City needs some help. Oh, I, yeah. I think they're going to get some. We we said this, and other folks have said this, though, once the Hollywood Brown injury went down, mm-hmm. that, listen, you got to hope all of your receivers stay healthy because if one more goes down for any reason, well, even if it's like a hamstring thing like with A.J. Brown in Philly, you're in trouble. Yeah, and I think that that's going to come back to haunt them. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately in this situation – they're really going to have to make some moves because obviously yeah. the Kadarius Tony experiment did not work. No. And they don't want to go through that going into the playoffs. So the Chiefs are going to make a move. And that's why I say I don't doubt them going for Tyreek Hill. Could be. Uh, I think because obviously we'll we'll just jump to the Dolphins game. Uh, yeah. So we got the Dolphins game where the uh, Tennessee Titans beat the Miami Dolphins 31 to 12. Exactly. And if Tua, who is rumored. Uh, according to a report here on CBS Sports, that he is symptom free. Hmm. Um, that they have a couple of reports uh, up there, and hmm. I'll just read. I'll just read the Adam Schefter quote here uh, that they have. Uh, Adam Schefter with an update on Tua. Tua has been symptom free, and he's been meeting with neurologists. And I don't believe anyone has told him anything right now to dissuade him from wanting to play. So that is from Finn Extra, and this is on a, from an article from CBS Sports. Okay, so he might be coming back soon. So, but that's week eight. That'll be the first week he's, oh, he's yeah, able to come he's back. Oh yeah, he's on IR, right? So that being said. If that holds up and Tua is coming back, that might be the only thing that the Dolphins might not want to make a move. But I fully think at this stage they're going to have to do something because mm-hmm. we're now at the end of week four. There's still three more weeks to play. This team is one in three. They have no offensive spark any which way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. They need to make a move, and I think in this situation, trading for trading Hill away might be the move to do. Could be. Because if your team is going to be out of playoff contention, might as well try getting some value here. Yeah. And I think that that would be smart in their situation. I mean, because I'm looking at, for the Chiefs, the free NFL uh, wide receiver free agents who are still available right now. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but even these names, like, they're not sexy. Hunter Renfro is available. Uh, Tim Patrick, who was with the Denver Broncos, is available. Uh, Russell Gage, who was with the Baltimore Ravens, is available. Michael Thomas is available. You know, but Randall Cobb. Is available, but like none of none of them were like, yeah, that'll fit. That'll, that's your fix. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. We'll definitely have to wait and see what happens, but I think you'll see them make some moves. And I mean, Tennessee got a win they needed, so this is true. Uh, then the other Monday night game was the Detroit Lions beating the Seattle Seahawks forty-two to twenty-nine. Couple of record breakers with this this stat line. Listen, to, yeah, what, sh- listen to this one. Jared Goff. 18 for 18, uh, 220, 292 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Amon Ross St. Brown, one for one, seven yards, one touchdown. So Detroit passing went 19 for 19. NFL record, never been done. The closest was a couple years ago, Drew Brees, when he was with New Orleans, went 29 of 30. Uh, and that's the, So a hell of a stat line there from Detroit, 19 for 19 passing. Detroit's the real deal. Yeah, they are. I mean, I think I, I will have to say I, I was wrong in saying they might have a little bit of a um, – surge hangover so to speak mm-hmm. they're playing at an elite level right now their defense is looking healthy which has been the one thing it has not been in quite some time mm-hmm. and we're seeing that everything that dan campbell and the team has been building over there is working they punched seattle right in the mouth mm-hmm. and seattle was no joke either so great win for detroit i mean arguably i think that they might be the best team in football mm-hmm. i understand minnesota's four and oh but in my opinion detroit is playing like that yeah so we'll definitely have to see what uh, their future holds as the weeks progress. Mm-hmm. Then we got to get into our teams. Yeah, I guess uh, you had the San Francisco 49ers beat the New England Patriots 30 to 13. Uh, Brock Purdy, 15, 27, 288 yards passing one touchdown, one interception. Uh, Jacoby Brissett, 19 to 32, 168 yards passing one touchdown, one interception. Ramondre Stevenson led the way for rushing, 13 or 43 uh, for 43, no touchdowns. Jordan Mason, 24 for 123 and one touchdown. Juwan Jennings led the way for San Francisco, three catches, 88 yards, no touchdowns. And Antonio Gibson led the way for New England, three for 67, no touchdowns. Uh, just one thing for New England Patriots fans who are sitting there saying, eh, this, is, this is the point, we got to put in Drake May. Do you want Drake May to get killed live on the field? Mm. Do you want a repeat of Mac Jones? Because that's what will happen if you put him on the field right now. A couple other stats with this. Uh, Jacoby Brissett was sacked six times during the game. For quarterback hits, the uh, 49ers got 10 quarterback hits on the Patriots. And I saw, because I, I wasn't able to watch the game, because unsurprisingly it wasn't on in our area, but I did see that during the game they talked about how 
like uh, San Francisco was rushing an average of like 15% of their plays the first few weeks. This one, it was up to 35%. The offensive line is hot garbage and injured. I'm looking at the injury report. Center David Andrews is listed as questionable. Uh, and, and according to Matt, uh, Mark Daniels of MassLive.com, he's getting multiple medical opinions on his shoulder injury. You've got uh, Viridian Lowe, one of the offensive tackles, is questionable. Michael Jordan, one of the guards, is is questionable. Uh, Caden Wallace is, uh, quote, was using crutches and wearing a boot on his left foot after the loss on Sunday. Mm. We have no offensive line. The, yeah. the, the offensive line is just decimated with, with injuries. And the fact that you gave up six sacks, ten quarterback hits, and you want to put a rookie in there? What are you, nuts? Yeah. This is a tank season, folks. Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, there's no shame in saying it. No. It was going to be a rebuilding season for the Patriots. This is a prime example. Good win for the 49ers, though, but, uh, yeah, for the Patriots, I think anybody wanted Drake May in there. Listen, the season, there's no shame in taking the L. Yeah. And I think that they need to realize that. Exactly. As for the Buffalo Bills, uh, Dose of Reality happened via the Baltimore Ravens. And the score indicated pretty much what Baltimore was imposing their will, to say the mm-hmm, least. Mm-hmm. 35 to 10, with Derrick Henry having a career resurgence. Jesus 20, Christ. 24 carries, a buck 99 on the ground, and one touchdown. I will say this for the Bills, this reminded me of a situation where when they got out to a hot start a couple of years ago, they got lax, mm-hmm. they got overconfident. Mm hmm. You have a Baltimore team that was ready to fight for their season because had they lost this, they go one and three. They went out of their way to punch the Bills in the mouth. Yeah, they did. And when the opening play is a Derrick Henry rush for 87 yards. Right. That was was like tied a franchise record. Oh, yeah. You knew there was going to be problems. The Ravens played very physical, albeit, though, there was a couple times where I thought they got a little too physical. One was especially a hit to Josh Allen after the play. Yeah, I saw the highlight. Which, in fairness, a certain Bill decided to take a shot at their uh, fullback as well. So Mm -hmm. they were getting very chippy. But the, the biggest takeaway from here is this was not on Josh Allen per se. The offense went away from what was working, mm-hmm. and when you can't make a stop on defense with the run, you're going to tire out, and that's exactly what happened. We've talked about this, and, and if you want to go through the archive of the show, the mm-hmm. Bills have always struggled against the run. They really struggled tonight, or as I should say, Sunday night, and they paid the ultimate price for it because they were still technically in this game until the second quarter where Tyler Bass missed a field goal. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this is not on him for the loss. Right. But you know my feelings towards that man. I don't think he's the kicker for the future for the Bills. I think they need to make a change there. Oh, I agree with you. And and we know your feelings on the Tyler Bass. They're well documented. Uh, mm-hmm. For those of you new to the show, hi. Uh, he, Ken, does not watch when Tyler Bass is kicking. Nope. He will look at his phone. He will look the other way. He will go into another room, just whatever it is. But... I agree with you. I don't put this loss on Tyler Bass because Tyler Bass didn't go one for 17, you know, and whatever for whatever extra points. I'm looking at his stat line. One for two from field goal range uh, and one for one from extra points. Okay, so he's responsible for three missed points. Even if he makes that kick, it's 35-13. Yeah. You, you, you still lose the game. You lose it very badly. Oh, yeah. But this goes to show about Baltimore came in and they just they they manhandled mm-hmm. the Bills. The Bills were overconfident. I think for all week here, they were the best team in football. I think got to them. Could be. They came in very underprepared. I blame that on Sean McDermott for because he did not keep them focused. And it came back to haunt them. And I also think they were looking past this week, too, which is foolish. Utterly foolish. Mm-hmm. Because they've got Houston next week. Mm-hmm. And I understand the Stefan Diggs drama. That's going to be all you're going to be hearing about for the next five days. Yeah. They look past them, they got punched in the mouth, and that's exactly what happened. I'm, I'm, see, I'm not going to necessarily put the loss on outside noise, you know, just because as, as a Patriots fan and somebody who's not entrenched in Bell's Mafia, mm-hmm. you, I, I didn't see or hear a lot of stuff that was like how great the Bills were. They, get, they got their flowers, and then they got their due for beating Jacksonville. But the more I saw with stuff was just how 
partway through the Jacksonville game, they were dancing on the field in between plays with the music oh, that, yeah. that was being played in the stadium. So I put it more on the offense and the defense of the players on the team in general took their foot off the gas and realized, oh, hey, we can win this easily. We can drop, you know, basically because they've scored 34, 31, and 47 the pr- three prior weeks. Oh, we can drop almost half a hundred on, you know, the blink of an eye. We got this. We can do this. Uh, to quote Eminem, snap back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. No, well, I think no, it's a lot of that too. But that's why I say it, it's a combination of both because I think they they overlooked Baltimore because Baltimore's sure. record at the time was one and two. Yeah, and they thought, oh, well, this would be an easy game, and then they're looking at Houston too. But yeah, no, I agree with you. When they got up so big against Jacksonville, they all started dancing to Mr. Brightside. That's like the song that's going to be now at the stadium. I yeah. would imagine. And I think that, yeah, they were just got way overconfident. But, no, in certain sports medias, I was watching, and everybody was anointing them. They're the best team in football. They're the MVP. Like, everybody needs to pause on that. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you start listening to that outside noise, that's what it started getting to. And that's where I think they did, because then I think they started switching the narrative towards this week with Houston. And that's where it came back to haunt them. And the thing is, if they're not prepared for Houston, Houston's going to do the exact same thing, except it's going to be an, an air show. Because yeah. I think C.J. Str- Stroud, I'm sure, has been talking with Stefan Diggs. And I'm sure Diggs is going to want to make a statement in this game. So the cornerbacks have better be on Diggs and better shut him down. Mm-hmm. And Nico Collins could have a breakout game too. But the Bills have to bounce back. That's going to be the big question mark. Have they done this before? Yes, because ironically, Derrick Henry did this to him on Tennessee. Oh, good he memory. Did, he did this to him a while ago. It was a Monday night football game, if memory serves me right. Exact same thing. They've always struggled against Derrick Henry because he just has a way of just overpowering everybody still at his age. So the Bills need to bounce back and and regroup, and I think they will. I think they're going to come in for this game and play more poised. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I don't think that Josh had a bad game per se. I know everybody's complaining about the flea flicker that went wrong. Right. Look, if you got an all-out blitz and you don't have enough people to block for it, yeah, you're going to completely mess that up, and that's Mm -hmm. exactly what happens. So. We'll have to wait to see how they bounce back for next week, but I got good feelings about it. I'm not going to say that's a lock, but we'll definitely have a lot to talk about in next week's show. Mm-hmm. So that being said, hit us on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. Week four is done in the NFL. How is your team doing? Let's talk about it, shall we? But first, we're going to get a quick break. We'll be right back. The content you are listening to is part of the Nerd Initiative Podcast Network. For more info about the home of pop culture positivity, check out nerdinitiative.com. Do you like comic books? What about movies and TV shows? Well, we may be the show for you. We're Hops Geek News, a weekly podcast that discusses comics, movies, and TV shows while featuring a beer of the week. Every week we chat about what we messed up on the week before, and then we dive into what we're reading and watching, as well as some news. We then wrap it up with a geek-themed topic of the week. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts by searching Hops Geek News. Cheers. Cheers. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And we have to preview a big week of TKO Entertainment this weekend. Oh, yeah, we do. Because very rarely do you have a WWE card, let alone a PLE, mm-hmm. start early because of the UFC. But that is what we're having this weekend. Because, yeah. Pat, what is going down Saturday, 6 p.m.? Starting at Saturday, 6 p.m., the special start time, as you alluded to, from the State Farm Arena in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, is WWE Bad Blood. Yes, indeed. So a throwback to an old school pay-per-view known for the Hell in a Cell match. Mm -hmm. So they have now brought that back and then some. So we will have to preview the card that was or this coming up this weekend. So, Pat, let's do it. Yeah, uh, it's the first Bad Blood card in 20 years. Last one was 2004. Yeah, I was going to say, they they switched names right after. Uh, First match we're going to talk about is the uh, singles match for the Women's World Championship with Liv Morgan defending her belt against Rhea Ripley and... Dominic Mysterio will be suspended above the ring in a shark cage. The most WCW match I think they've done in a while here. For a while, in a while, yeah. 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 I mean, they, they haven't done a, a shark cage match in quite some time. Yep. But the, the biggest soap opera going on in WWE uh, takes another twist as mm-hmm. Rhea Ripley is going to get her chance to get some revenge. Yep. How will it play out? Well, I think we're going to have and still. Okay. I have a feeling there was a line that was mentioned on Monday Night Raw when everybody from the Judgment Day or whatever they're known as now Mm -hmm. was by the car. Yeah, Dom's lowrider. Yeah. And Finn was on the phone, and he said, hey, tell Liv I got it taken care of for her. And 
pending health status, I'm not doubting that it's Raquel Rodriguez that's going to come in mm. and help Liv win. Maybe. So I'm going to throw that out there. I'm going to go with Ann Still, too, but I don't think it's going to be because of a new run-in. I think it's going to be because he messed with the shark cage in some capacity. And despite the fact Dominic Mysterio is supposed to be unable to escape said shark cage, he's going to find a way to get out of it. Whether, whether the lock got tampered with or you know some part of it was a quote-unquote uh, you know, weakened in some capacity that he's able to get out of there real easily, or in this case, it'd be gimmicked. Uh, Dom's going to get out of there in some capacity. It probably will happen, but I mean, this should be a, an entertaining match. Nevertheless, mm-hmm. I think this will be the blow off for their feud. So that's why I say, like, I'm not doubting we have some outside interference. Yeah. And that's why I say, I'm not sure, but I don't know the health status of Raquel. So True. I'm not sure where she's at right now. Uh, next up is a singles match between Damian Priest and Finn Balor. Well, another big match that's going down, and especially one of the more heated rivalries in WWE. Yeah. The implosion of the Judgment Day has now led us to this moment. So Damian Priest has been trying to get revenge on Finn Balor, and I think by the time it's all said and done, he's going to have this moment. So I am going to say that Priest defeats Balor. I'm not sure how exactly. But I think he's going to get the win outright. Yeah, I think between the factions here, between the Terror Twins and Judgment Day 2.0, they're going to split the matchups, I guess you could say. Plus, I can see what this Damian Priest, Finn Balor thing, the Liv Rhea thing's been going on for a while. The, the Damian Finn's just kind of getting going. I can see this being a, a trilogy of matches between the two. So I, I think this one's not, not going to be a one and done, but Priest is going to uh, emerge victorious with this one. See, I could see him winning and then coming back. Sure. So sure. that's where I kind of go because I'm just I'm not sure if they're going to want to tie up everything going on with Rhea and Damian uh, and the Judgment Day for for a few more months because mm-hmm. we are going to start getting as crazy as sounds into Survivor Series wall games. games territory. So we'll have to kind of see how this we'll all see. shapes up for that. Next up is a Hell in a Cell match between CM Punk and Drew McIntyre. It's weird. This isn't going to be the main event. It, it really should be. It should be, but I, unless they call an audible, which they are entitled to, but I don't think they're going to do it. The best storyline in WWE right now, I will uh-huh. say. CM Punk, who has been on the revenge tour against Drew McIntyre. They've gone back and forth. Injuries have, have kind of held things back a little bit. Mm-hmm. But this match is the definition of a blood feud. This is one that has now escalated to a point that it needs a blow-off match. They mm-hmm. need to have a definitive who's going to win this. And there's no other more dangerous match outside of an NXT parking lot match (laughs) than a Hell in a Cell match. This is true. So this will be a wild match. Yeah. I don't expect a lot of run-ins. I don't think we're going to have anything like that. It is going to be violent. It is going to get bloody. It's going to be a mess. I do think, though, at the end of the day, CM Punk wins. I Yeah, I agree with this. Yeah, I think I think if, if Drew wins, where does Punk go from here? Yeah, well, and that's the thing is Drew doesn't need to beat Punk to keep going. Mm-hmm. Punk needs the win, you know, to, to kind of blow things off and just kind of move on, move things along. Um, it's going to be wild though. It's going to be hard hitting, and I like the one line from Monday Night Raw where Punk was telling Drew, he's like, "You've you've turned me into everything my detractors say I am." Yeah. Oh, good lord. Yeah, no, a great line. Next up is a singles match for the WWE Women's Championship with Nia Jax defending her belt against Bailey. One of the more low-key storylines going on, but yeah. one that has been great, though, I will mm-hmm, say, mm-hmm. since Nia Jax has won the belt uh, and Tiffany Stratton has been lurking. Her, her lurking in the background, never know when she's going to cash in the money in the bank, the bank briefcase. So there has been that kind of dynamic going on, especially one where Bailey has been coming back and got put into like an almost a semi feud with Naomi yeah. about who's going to get the shot. Yeah. So I think this has had a solid build, and like I say, it's very low key. Mm-hmm. But we'll have to wait to see where this goes from here. I, to be honest with you, I don't see how Nia loses this unless they pull the call and have Tiffany cash in. I think they might just because Nye has definitely been at Tiffy's throat the last couple of weeks mm-hmm. and really like harping on her about stuff. So I, I wouldn't doubt that Tiffany's had, you know what? I've had enough. Yeah. T- it's Tiffy time. Uh, next up is the, was, it might be the main event. It could, I think it might open. I, th- I think they might have Helena cell close. I think this one might open uh, just to give it an early production. That'd be, if they do that, that'd be wild. Just because there's a lot going on with this match, and this is this has got a lot of ramifications, and that is the tag team match between Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns taking on the Bloodline in Solo Sokoa and Jacob Fatu. And 
Tama Tonga and Tonga Law are going to be there as well. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, this would be insane if they did. I mean, I'm not going to lie. If they open with a show, I, this I, is this is either this is I'm betting this opens, and then you'll do Live and Rhea after. Well, I mean, we'll have to wait to see about this. Um, but still, one of the one of the best storylines going on. The, the bloodline is the literal fight forever yep. because it's it's not going anywhere. So Roman Reigns has returned. They cut a great cinematic promo at the Georgia mm-hmm. Tech uh, football field, and really built this up into where they're heading towards WrestleMania and, and the Royal Rumble. So I love mm-hmm. how they're setting this up. And I think when this is all said and done, you're gonna have Roman win. I don't think the bloodline pulls this off. And I think you're going to have a debut of somebody, whether it's the return of Jimmy Uso, mm-hmm. whether it's Hikaleu, mm-hmm. whether it's somebody else. Mm-hmm. You're going to have somebody else get into the mix here because we have to start building up for Wolf Games in November. So things are going to start moving fast. Mm-hmm. Whether it's maybe, like I said, Sami Zayn might get involved in this. Right. I, it just depends on where they want to go because – I don't doubt with how they've been building on SmackDown, mm-hmm. Kevin Owens doesn't make the turn. Could be. And attacks Cody and thus prompting Sami Zayn to confront him. They get into a little uh, smir- uh, yeah, a little, little uh, smack talk. Yeah, a little uh, skirmish there. Yeah. And yeah. they wind up having to go down. So, okay. like I say, I could see something like that happen. But I'm going to say, uh, yeah, I just don't, I don't see the bloodline winning. But. And there's also like a point I think they might have to. Like I'm not down. It's gonna go one of two ways. I think uh, Cody and Roman win because yeah. of reasons. Yeah. Or Solo pins Roman and sets the internet crazy, mm-hmm. and then that leads to war games. So I actually think Bloodline 2.0 is gonna pin Roman. Okay. And win this match just because I I don't think the story is gonna be the whole oh Cody and Roman can they exist, can they coexist whatever blah blah blah. I think you've got to get to War Games somehow. And in between now and War Games, the only pay-per-view you've got is there's a Crown Jewel card uh, taking place over in Saudi Arabia November 2nd. So you've got a little bit of time in between now and then, but you've got to start getting this whole thing together. And as has been the speculation for months now, is it's going to be Bloodline 1.0 versus Bloodline 2.0, and you got to get that going. And, and thus far, Roman has been holding his own fairly well against the bloodline, but he has been getting his butt kicked the last couple of weeks. Roman's got to realize I can't do this on my own. I need help to do this. Now, I don't think Jimmy's going to return here, but he is going to be coming back soon just because Jay did mention him on Monday night raw this week. So I think that could be starting to plant the little seeds like, Hey, he's going to be coming back here soon. I don't think Hikaleo will be showing up just because it's been reported and rumored. He's been added to the NXT roster. So could he always show up and swerve everybody? Maybe. But as the reporting has been thus far, uh, he's going to be going to NXT. But I think for this immediate match, I, I don't think the story is going to be Cody and Roman. I, th- I think Ta- Tonga, Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa are going to take Cody out. However that is, Cody's going to get the holy hell beat out of him. Mm. And that's going to leave Roman by himself. And Roman just get the holy hell beat out of him. And Solo, I think Solo is going to be the one to pin Roman. And that's going to lead Roman to either it's the you know the SmackDown after or two weeks after if if he wants to really sell getting his butt kicked, you know comes back not the not the uh, the next SmackDown but the week after. So this would be two weeks from now I think if I'm if my math is right. Have Roman come back two weeks from the, this week and realize I need help if I'm going to take care of this this problem, you know. And that's when he brings in Jimmy. And that's when he goes and gets Jay and however else they want to set up the Survivor Series match from there. It could happen. I mean, there's still a lot of moving parts involved. Sure. Brock Lesnar's name has been circulating around the internet. Yeah. Because so, yeah, yeah. I guess he was added back to the roster page. I mean, for me, I never look on that stuff. I just kind of no. go, go into it and go, okay, cool. Yeah. We'll see if it happens. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. But I think they are going to be building in for war games. And wherever the play goes from here, yeah. I, I'm expecting somebody's debuting, somebody's coming back. There will be an added uh, wrestler involved in this probably mess. so we'll have to wait to see how probably. it plays out a lot of stuff happening here i mean yeah. i think i mean obviously usa is now the home of smackdown yeah the, uh, this this week's monday night raw was the last one that was three hours yep they're going to two hours going forward it'll be two hours which works perfectly for you and i because uh superman and lois premieres in a couple weeks yes 
And, we, and, and, if, and it starts right after Monday Night Raw finishes. Yeah, so we desperately need that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering how we were going to work this out and, and watch the episodes, but no, that works perfectly. I appreciate the Triple H and everybody is yeah. understanding of that yeah. for us. We do. Thank you, guys. Yeah. We always love being pressed for you, so that definitely helps. A lot of great stuff happening going on, especially this week for WWE because mm-hmm. NXT is debuting in Chicago yeah. on, on, on the CW as we're recording. Punk is teasing something showing up, and it's not his dog Larry. I think Punk might be getting his ice cream bars. Well, we'll have to wait to see. Because he, he posted on Instagram, come hungry. Well, you, I tell you what, if they do that, that'd be great. So it's either Mindy's or it's ice cream bars. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of great storylines going on there, too. Julia versus Roxanne Perez oh, with Stephanie oh, McKeever Jesus. lurking in the background. Yeah. You have Trick Williams and Ethan Page for the world title. CM Punk is going to be guest referee. Yep. I believe that there is an open tag team match for the show. Yeah. Which, I'm not doubting we finally get the debut of the Motor City Machine Guns on NXT, which I they're going to be called. Well, exactly. Or the long shot, which I mean, if it happens, uh, I think the Internet would explode. And that's the Lucha Bros. So the card as it currently stands is there's going to be a special appearance by Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill, uh, Lola Vice and Jada Parker versus two members of Fatal Influence. Okay. Uh, you've got, as you alluded to, the NXT Championship match with the special guest referee CM Punk uh, roughing Ethan Page versus Trick Williams. You've got the NXT Women's Championship with Roxanne Perez and Julia. Uh, Miz TV will be making an appearance there at uh, Chicago. And then you, again, you've got the street fight between Zachary Wentz and Wesley. And that's going to be wild, too. That's going to be absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. So, like I say, there will be some moving parts going on, too, and especially the Miz segment after his turn on Truth on, on Monday. I'm wondering how that's going to go over with the crowd. <laughs> I'm wondering. Yeah. There's a lot of great stuff that's been going on. WWE television has been really on fire. AEW very briefly has their fifth year anniversary of Dynamite this week. Yeah, good for them. So Will Osprey versus Ricochet. If you're a longtime internet fan, you know what that means. So yeah. Yeah. we'll see how that plays out. Plus Brian Danielson versus Okada and the and the Continental title is on the line for the first 20 minutes. Which is the most weird stipulation I've ever heard. I'm not asking questions. I will defer that to. Th- I'm, I'm with MJF. I need NASA and Albert Einstein to explain this to yeah. me. Yeah, I, I don't I don't get it. I don't like it. <laughs> well, no, we can't explain it. Reasons. Reasons. Indeed, indeed. But if you want more wrestling talk about that, uh, Wrestling Night Live, every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Nerd Initiative YouTube. In the meantime, though, hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag OTPagePod. WWE Bad Blood is going down Saturday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What's your predictions? Let's talk about it. And where do you think everything is going to be falling out from NXT Chicago? Definitely want to have those conversations as well. So hit us up. Let us know. We're going to get a quick breakout. We'll be right back. You ever wondered what comics Mark from Vale Mai is into? What Zach from Left Behind's favorite MCU movies are? Well, Metalcore Nerds is the show for you. My name is Sean Ma, and here at Metalcore Nerds, we cover the latest things in pop culture, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, DC, AEW, and everything else in between. You can listen to the show every Monday on Adobe Howl at 7 p.m. Eastern, or find it anywhere you find podcasts after it debuts on the radio station. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and it's a TKO takeover. Yeah, it is. Because Saturday night, we've got another fight card going down via the UFC. So somebody cue the Elton John. Yeah, because Saturday night's all right for fighting, and definitely going to have a lot going on with UFC 307. Pad, let's talk about yeah, it. Yeah, so taking place this Saturday from the Delta Delta Center in Scott or Salt Lake City, Utah. It's the oldest fight card in UFC history in terms of age. So yeah, this according to an article on ESPN.com, uh, it says, quote, According to ESPN research, the highest average age on a UFC fight card was 33.8. And then there's a whole bunch of numbers. Years at April's UFC 300, headlined by Pereira versus Jamal Hall Hill. That record will fall this weekend. Quote, I didn't go into decimals in my calculation, but the average age among the 24 fighters scheduled to compete at UFC 307 is 34.4. Seasoned veterans. That's what we'll define it as. Seasoned veterans. Hell yeah, baby. They're going to talk about a couple of fights on this card. Yeah, let's talk about it, Um, Main eventing the prelim card. One for the older fans here, maybe. Steven Wonderboy Thompson taking on Joaquin Buckley. Well, what can you say? Steven Wonderboy Thompson, uh, always a contender. One that is very heavily focused on karate. Mm -hmm. Is taking on Joaquin Buckley, who rose to fame with a couple of very famous knockouts. So this fight, I think, will be a great main event for the prelim card. Mm-hmm. 
I think though when it's all said and done, I think Stephen Thompson will outpoint him. I think that he's okay. going to keep a, he's going to keep a good safe distance. He doesn't want to press Buckley on this. I think he's got a great reach advantage on this. Uh, Stephen Thompson has a 75 inch reach, 191 centimeters for you folks overseas. Uh, Joaquin Buckley has a reach of 76 inches and 193 centimeters. Yeah. So uh, Stephen Thompson fighting at the ripe young age of 41 years old. He just turned 41 back in February. He has a record in 25 professional matches, 17 wins, seven losses, one draw. Currently on a one fight losing streak. Lost to Shavkat Rachmanov with a rear naked choke submission back at you. UFC 296 that was in December of last year uh, then you've got uh, Joaquin Buckley who has a record of 25 matches 19 wins six losses currently on a one two three four fight win streak uh, won his last fight via unanimous decision that was against Nerlston uh, Ruza Bo- Ruza Boev, I think is how you say it, uh, knocked out Vincente Luke uh, back in March of 2024. Uh, then he beat Alex uh, Morano via unanimous decision and beat Andre uh, Filajo with a TKO, a head kick. That was in May of 2023. Last loss was to Chris Curtis, who knocked him out in uh, December of 2022. I'm going to go with youth over experience here because Joaquin Buckley, 30 years old, so he's got 11 years on the guy. I'm going with youth over experience in this one. I'm going Buckley. All right. Uh, next up is in the middleweight division as the first card on the or first fight on the main card uh, middleweight division matchup between Roman Dolidze and Kevin Holland oh, you can't go against Kevin Holland uh, one of the more entertaining <coughs> fighters in the UFC uh, I believe Dana White's nickname for him is Big Mouth because he <laughs> does not <laughs> stop talking uh, Dolizze is definitely a sound competitor as well this will be a fun fight I will say I think it's gonna be Dolizze I think he's gonna outpoint him Holland, I think, is going to want to keep this standing, but I could definitely see this uh, turning into a grappling match. Holland's ground Probably. game has improved, though, I will say that, but I don't think it's going to be enough. I think it's going to be a, a split decision, but I think Dolze walks with this one. So, uh, for Roman Dolze, 16 professional matches, 13 wins, 3 losses, currently on a one-fight winning streak, beat Anthony Smith via unanimous decision back in June of this year. Prior to that, was on a two-fight losing streak, lost via majority drop to Nesrudin Amavov. Uh, that was back in February of this year. Then he lost to Marvin Vittori via unanimous decision back in uh, March of last year. Uh, then you've got Kevin Holland, who in 38 professional matches has a record of 26 wins, 11 losses, one no contest, currently on a one-fight winning streak, uh, beat Michael Olitsichuk, I think is how you say that, O-L-E-K-S-I-E-J-C-Z-U-K. Uh, arm bar submission, technical arm bar submission there. Back in June of this year, prior to that, was on a two-fight losing streak. Lost to Michael Page via unanimous decision in March of this year, and then lost to Jack Della Maddalena via split decision in September of last year. Um... I'm gonna say prob. I'm gonna go with you on this one. I'm gonna say Dolidze, but it's gonna be points and like a probably a split decision uh, win. Yeah, I could see this. I could see this honestly going Holland's way, but I think Dolidze is just. Uh, I think he's too more sound than he is on the on the ground. Yeah. Uh, next up is a women's bantamweight matchup between Ketlin uh, Vieira and Kayla Harrison. Well, Kayla Harrison has been one of the big names of free agency to come over to the UFC. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a dominant fighter. Whew. So I could fully see if she gets past Vieira, and I think she will, she will be in that title contention. Probably. Easily. So Ketlin Vieira in 17 professional matches has a record of 14 wins, three losses, currently on a one-fight winning streak, beat Penny uh, Kianzad in via unanimous decision back in July of last year. Uh, prior to that, was on a one-fight losing streak who and lost to Raquel Pennington via split decision in January of last year. She does have wins against Holly Holm and Misha Tate, though. Ooh, not bad. Not bad. Uh, for Kayla Harrison, 18 professional matches, 17 wins, one loss, currently on a two-fight winning streak, uh, beat Holly Holm with a rear naked choke submission in her UFC debut back at UFC 300. Uh, and then beat Aspen Ladd in her PFL uh, finale, I guess you could say, with the unanimous decision win. Her last loss was to Larissa Pacheco uh, via unanimous decision that was in November of 2022. So just for the sheer fact that, like, listen, both of these women are equally matched, I would say, in terms of record and skill sets. I'm going to say Kayla Harrison, though, just because the one thing that's concerning for me, and we've said it before, we'll say it again. Vieira's last fight was on July 22nd, 2023. We are over a year since that date. Kayla mm. Harrison's last fight, April. Yeah. You can train all you want. You can spar all you want. You can go do a gauntlet match if we're talking WWE against uh, uh, fighters in your same weight class If in training. It don't matter. It's not the same thing as actually getting in that octagon and fighting another opponent. So 
a little bit. I think there's gonna be a little bit of octagon rust, but and I think uh, Kayla Harrison sharp as a sharp as a knife and wants to come in there and show like, hey, I'm the real deal. Harrison, according to UFC.com, is a minus nine hundred. Oh, Jesus. So. Like I say, I have to side with the books on this one. I think that Harrison is going to just absolutely uh, take out Vieira early. So, and that'll put her in prime position for a title shot. So, probably. Next up is a bantamweight matchup between Jose Aldo and Mario Batista. Well, Jose Aldo at bantamweight, I, I still am in shock to say that. The king of the featherweight division for many, many years mm-hmm. is still fighting and is now in a in a unique spot. Ripe young age of thirty eight. Yeah, which I mean, he's had a. We always say tread on the tires. He's got a lot. Just turned thirty eight. Mm-hmm. So taking on the eleventh ranked Batista. This is an interesting fight. I hate going against Aldo, but I mean, I think at this age. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't. Oh, I just don't see two. it. One and two, two and two, three and two, three and three. Uh, so in his uh, Aldo made his bantamweight debut uh, back at UFC 245, where he lost to Marlon Moraes. In his time at bantamweight, he's zero and two, one and two, two and two, three and two, three and three. He's four and three. So, yeah, just above 500. Uh, currently on a one-fight winning streak, he beat, uh, so in his, I should give his full record, 40 professional matches, 32 wins, 8 losses. Currently on a one-fight winning streak, he beat Jonathan Martinez via unanimous decision back in May. Lost to Marab uh via unanimous decision back in August of 2022. Uh, prior to that, three-fight winning streak against Rob Font, Pedro Munoz, and Marlon Farah. For Mario Batista, 16 professional matches, 14 wins, two losses, currently on a good lord. One, two, three, four, five, six fight winning streak. Beat Ricky Sim- uh, Simone via unanimous decision in his last fight. That was in January of this year. Beat Damon Blackshear via unanimous decision. That was in August of last year. Beat uh, Guido Canetiti. Canet- uh, via rear naked choke submission back in March of last year. It beat Benito Lopez with a reverse triangle armbar submission. Ooh. It's not one year every day. Mm-hmm. That was back at uh, November 5th of 2022. Be- beat Brian Kelleher with a rear naked choke submission back in 2022. Uh, and then he beat Jay Perrin via uh, unanimous decision in February of 2022. Has actually not lost since Trevin Jones knocked him out at UFC 259 in March of 2021. Good Lord. What's this? Uh, 31 years old. I uh, just turned 31. I'm going to go, as shocking as this might sound, I'm going to actually go Batista on this one. No, I mean, I think I'm, I'm there with you. Like, I mean, I'd love to see Aldo pull it off and, mm-hmm. and defy Father Time. And, and, you know, experience is one thing. But to be at this age mm-hmm. you know, against the number 11, like, I think it's – I hate saying stepping stone fight, but that's what it kind of feels like to me. He, also, he is also very streaky at this point because he, he went on that run, you know, in the mid-2000s uh, or early mid-2000s where, like – he went up against, uh, this is for Gold Fighters Championship 1, mm-hmm. Tiago Meller. He was going into that fight. He was 7-1. and one. He then did not, so that was on May 20th of 2006. He did not lose again until the Conor McGregor fight in December 2015. And ever since that Conor fight, you know, he won one, lost two. Won two, lost three. Won three, lost one. He's won one. He's a very streaky guy. Well, you have to remember, though, at that point, you're dominant from, what, 2006, he said, to, to 2015. So he he had the fight against Chad Mendez in October 2014, and then didn't fight again until the Connor uh, fight. So that's almost nine years. Yeah, of being the best in the world. Mendez, Ricardo Lamas, Korean Zombie, Frankie Edgar, Kenny Florian, Mark Kamenik, Uriah Faber, Cobb Swanson, Mike Brown. It's like a who's who, right? So he's fought everybody in that at that weight class, and then Connor got some him of out. those fights are WEC. Oh yeah, oh I remember he took Cub Swanson's head off with a flying knee to open the bout. It's one of the most legendary knockouts like this side of Masvidal and eight, Ben Askren. Eight seconds in the first round. Yeah, yeah, and like I say, he he set a very high bar. But the problem is when you're dominant for that long, the division ultimately catches up with you. Mm-hmm. Father Time has better fighters. Yeah. And that's why he started streaking as much, and that's why he tried doing lightweight, didn't really work out to, yeah. to my le- yeah. my recollection. Like I don't think he had a good go there. I mean, so he, then he, he tried did, dropping the 135. Which yeah, was, I mean, he, after the counter fight, he beat Frankie Edgar, lost to Holloway, Holloway t- back-to-back times, beat uh, Stevens and R- Renato Moicano, lost to Volkanovski and uh, Moraes, lost to Peter Yan, he beat Vera, uh, he beat Pedro Munoz, beat Rob Font, uh, lost to Divishvili, and then got the Martinez win. Yeah, or you know what? Honestly, I think he might just. I don't think he went to lightweight. I think they were talking to him about that, but I don't think he. Ah, uh, that was. Let's see. The Connor fight was for featherweight. 
Yeah, no, but after that, though, I don't think he ever went off. Featherway, lost to Featherway, Featherway, Featherway. No, he was still Featherway until he made his bantamweight debut That's right. in uh, December 29th. See, I always, I always thought he would have been better at lightweight because mm. he used to cut crazy to get down to 145. Mm-hmm. So that's why I say, like, I know you didn't stay around that long, but I thought he should have gone up there. But, he, him, but, yeah, but him in this bantamweight division, I mean, anything is possible. I just don't see it happening. Next up is the co-main event of the evening, and it is for the UFC Women's Bantamweight Championship with Raquel Pennington defending her belt against Juliana Pena. This is going to be a great fight. Oh, baby. Pennington, if she can let her hands go, is going to give Pena fits. Mm-hmm. Pena is going to want to take her down and make this into a grappling fest. Mm-hmm. So striker versus wrestler, so to speak. That's how this is going to go. You got the stats lined up. I do. So for champion Raquel Pennington, 24 professional matches, 16 wins, 8 losses, currently on a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 fight winning streak. Uh, beat Myra Bueno Silva in her last fight via unanimous decision. That was back in January. Beat Ketlin Vieira via split decision in January of last year. Beat Aspen Ladd via unanimous decision in 2022. Beat Macy Chiesen with a guillotine choke submission in 2021. She beat Penny uh, Kianzad with an unanimous decision win back in 2021. And then beat Marion Renault via unanimous decision in June 2020. Last loss was to Holly Holm via unanimous decision in January of 2020. For Juliana Pena, 16 professional matches, 11 wins, 5 losses, currently on a one-fight losing streak. Uh, lost to Amanda Nunes versus una- via unanimous decision, UFC 277 in July of 2022. Prior to that, was on a two-fight winning streak. Uh, beat Amanda Nunes with a rear naked choke submission back in 2021. Uh, and then another rear naked choke submission win against Sarah Mc- uh, McMahon in January 2021. So, been a little bit of time since we've last seen Juliana Pena. Yeah, I mean, she's had a very interesting uh, career in the UFC. I mean, coming back from a very nasty leg injury to, yeah. to rise to the ranks, pulling off the unstoppable uh, feat of defeating Nunez. Mm-hmm. Nunez ultimately came back to get the belt back and then decided to ride off and, and re- enjoy retirement, which, I mean, clearly has hey. earned. Yeah. Not faulting that one bit. So yeah. seeing now that Pena is back in for the title picture against Raquel, like I said, I, this is striker versus res- grappler. Mm-hmm. I think Pena takes this. Mm-hmm. I think Pena is going to go in, and she's going to want to take this to the ground, and I think that's that's where Raquel is going to struggle. Raquel needs to clip her and clip her quick. Okay, she can't let this get into the championship rounds. Like they need to, she if she has any chance to win, she needs to wrap it up by the third. I'm going to say Raquel just because it goes back to what I've said before. It's been over, you know, it, well, two and a half years now. Basically, since we last saw Juliana Pena, she's coming off a rib injury from her last fight. All the meanwhile, you have uh, P- uh, Pennington has not missed much time at all. Fought mm-hmm. 2024, 2023, 2022, 2021, 2020, like has not missed time. I just think, it, like I said, you can train with the best. You can train with the with the greatest and you can dominate the hell out of training camp. Doesn't mean squat till you get back in that octagon. And listen, it's nothing against Juliana Pena, but just. A little bit of time off and, and a little bit of octagon rust. I, I think Pennington's going to retain. Mm-hmm. We'll have to wait and see. Then you've got the main event, which is for the light heavyweight championship with Alex Pereira defending his belt against Khalil Roundtree Jr. Well, this is going to be straight up fireworks. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is not going to be anything less than a main event slugfest. Yep. I don't see any ground game going on here. I think you're literally going to have just them throwing haymakers left and right. I'm going to spoil the stats early. Neither one of these individuals have a win by submission. Yeah. So if you're betting in Vegas or betting on pick your favorite uh, gambling app, uh, don't don't pick a submission one. No. Just going just give you a little spoiler. Uh, for these two individuals, uh, for the champion, Alex Pereira, 13 professional matches, 11 wins, two losses, currently on a one, two, three, four fight winning streak. Uh, he knocked out Jerry Prochaka in his last fight. That was in uh, June of this year. Knocked out Jamal Hall Hill. That was at UFC 300 in April of this year. Knocked out Prochaka again. This was the first time. Uh, that was in November 2023. And then he beat uh, Jan Blahovitz via split decision in July of 2023. His last loss. Israel Adesanya was a knockout loss in April of 2023 for Khalil Roundtree Jr. 19 professional matches, 13 wins, 5 losses, 1 no contest, currently on a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 fight winning streak. Knocked out Anthony Smith in his last fight. That was in December of last year. Uh, Knocked out Chris uh, 
Daukas, I think is how you say that. Uh, that was in August of 2023. Split decision win against Dustin Jacoby. That was in August of 2022. Uh, knocked out Carl Ro- uh, Roberson uh, in March of 2022. And then he knocked out uh, Modestas uh, Bau- Bauskas, I think is how you say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was in September of 2021. Last loss was against Marcin uh, Procino. That was in uh, January of 2021. Well, I think it's Perez. I think this is going to be absolutely yeah. wild. This is going to be fireworks. Uh, Khalil is going to come at him. Like there, he's not going to back down by no. any any means. No. But if he can really land some some shot, I think he can. But Perea is known to keep going forward. He's known for a, a ridiculously amount of power that people don't realize he has. Uh-huh. So I think when he goes in there, he's going to want to do some damage early. I don't think this is going to be that. I don't see this going decision by any stretch of the imagination. No, I don't either. I think this is Perea's to lose. I think the and the thing that I've been reading all about this fight is Roundtree says he wants to stand with him. He wants to stand <laughs> and bang. Oh, that might be a bad idea. Like, listen, God, I... God bless you. Uh, I think that's a bad, bad call. But listen, yeah. if you, want, if you want to put it on a show for the fights. God bless. Like I say, Pereira, since he's made his light heavyweight debut, that was the Jan Blahovitz fight, has gone the distance once, and that was the Jan Blahovitz fight. That was three five minute rounds. The latest he's gone in a light heavyweight matchup since that debut fight was against Prochaka the first time, where it was four minutes and eight seconds of the second round. For after that, three minutes and fourteen of the first. 13 seconds into the second. Yeah. He has got some place to be, and he does not have a lot of time. I don't think this goes to the third. I, I'm agreeing with you. I think the first round is the feeling out round. Sure. And they're working on getting everybody's timing down. I think Perea is going to get impatient, though, and just really press him. Sure. And I think he, he clips him in the second. So I'm sure. going to say, if not a head kick, he's going to hit him with an uppercut, and that's going to be lights out. Agreed. Great night of fights all lined up, though. Like I say, it's going to be an exciting card, like season veterans night, if you want to say. But uh-huh. it's one that if you're an old school UFC fan or one that really understands the game, you're going to have a lot of fighters going in there and try to leave it all in the cage. It is definitely one to watch this weekend. That being said, his up hashtag OD page pod. What's your thoughts about UFC 307 taking place this weekend? Who you got winning? And, and let's talk about the fights. Like I say, we really want to talk some UFC with everybody this weekend. So hit us up. Let us know. We're going to take our final break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad! What you got? Got a couple things to talk about. Uh, first, which is obviously a local minute, uh, kind of that still in between period baseball season done, hockey season getting ready to start up, uh, and the hockey season for the FPHL. Uh, that is the Federal Prospects Hockey League starts up in the uh, second week of October. Friday, October 11th is the Binghamton Black Bears first game where they start their defense of their championship from last season. Uh, they will be playing up in Watertown, playing the Watertown Wolves. That's at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. They do not make their home debut uh, until the following uh, following night that is saturday october 12th where they will be playing those same watertown wolves so for more information all that good stuff binghamtonblackbears.com and we got to talk a little bit of baseball because the regular season is over the postseason is set after a thrilling monday with uh everything going on between the new york mets and the uh atlanta braves holy hell that was nuts Mm -hmm. uh you had the braves went out to an early so basically it was a whole kerfuffle of you know they had to play double header that got delayed if it, something if things went down one way on Sunday, they wouldn't have had to play the doubleheader on Monday. It would have been meaningless. Didn't go that way, so they had to play the doubleheader on Monday. Playoff implications of who played where, who played when. You know, Braves jumped out to an early 3 nothing lead. Mets came back in the eighth inning, scored six runs yeah. to put them up 6-3. to three. Braves answered back, went up 7-6. Mets in the top of the ninth inning uh, had Francisco Lindor hit a two-run home run. Edwin Diaz then went, put me back in the fucking game. I got this. It was absolutely bonkers. Uh, but the way things stand out as we record... Uh, in the American League side for the wild card division, you've got the Detroit Tigers taking on the Houston Astros. Uh, the winner of that matchup goes on to play the Cleveland Guardians, who are the two seed. Uh, and then the other wild card matchup is the Kansas City Royals taking on the Baltimore Orioles. The winner of that will take on the number one seeded New York Yankees. Let's go. Number one seed in the American League. So they do have home field advantage throughout the uh, American League side of the playoffs. Uh, on the National League side, it is the New York Mets taking on the Milwaukee Brewers. 
Uh, winner of that matchup will take on the Philadelphia Phillies. Then you've got the Atlanta Braves taking on the San Diego Padres, and the winner of that will take on the number one seed in the National League and number one seed in all of baseball, uh, the L.A. Dodgers. So got a couple interesting matchups. And, of course, wild card games did start today as we record. Uh, you had the Detroit Tigers. These are a best of three series. Uh, so you had the Detroit Tigers take a one one nothing series lead against the Houston Astros, winning 3-1. and one. Uh, And currently, as we record, the New York Mets are taking on the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, currently in the top of the fifth inning, it is four to three. Uh, so Brewers leading early there. You also had the uh, Kansas City Royals defeat the Baltimore Orioles one to nothing. Uh, so Kansas City's up one game to nothing there. And the only other game uh, that we're waiting on because it well, hasn't started yet, Atlanta Braves taking on the San Diego Padres. So a lot of baseball going on, a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff happened in the MLB, so definitely something yeah. to look forward to, especially us Yankee fans. Hell yeah, baby. And then uh, before we get into the NBA talk, uh, we definitely want to say, unfortunately, we had two deaths in the sports world. Yeah. One uh, was Pete Rose, mm-hmm. who passed away at the age of 83. Yeah. So the Charlie Hustle, the longtime hit king who has – All-time hit king. All-time hit king who uh, unfortunately had a uh, you know very, very well-known situation about yeah, gambling that yeah. came in – a very polarizing topic, if you will. Uh, 17-time All-Star, three-time World Series champion, was the NL MVP in 1973, was the World Series MVP in 1975, won the Rookie of the Year for the National League in 1963, two-time Gold Glove winner, uh, won the Silver Slug Award in 1981, Roberto Clemente Award in 1976, three-time batting champion. Uh, his, his number 14 was retired with the Cincinnati Reds. He's in the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame, and he was a member of the uh, Major League Baseball All-Century Team for uh, the 1900s uh, finished with a, a, a major league record 4,256 career hits. He's the all-time career singles leader with 3,215. He's the all-time, uh, he's got the Major League Baseball record for career games played with 3,562 career games played. Major League Baseball record for career at bats, 14,053. And he's got the MLB record for career plate appearances with 15,890. Yeah. Uh, just for a little bit of how he managed all those hits. 24-year career, uh, he he averaged, I want to say, it was like 177 hits a season. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the benchmark if you want to beat his record of how many hits you need over. And you got to pay play tw- at least 24 years to get near that record. So good lord, yeah, hell of a career though. But hell of a career, Charlie Hustle. And I mean, yeah. obviously, un- unfortunately, he never got into the Hall of Fame because of the whole yeah, you know, gambling yeah situation. Which obviously, there's been a, there's been you know a couple pushes over the years. And 2021 or 2022, he wrote a letter to, to the commissioner. Uh, about rescinding the ban and, and allowing him to get in the Hall of Fame. The commissioner said no. So obviously, given the news, that there will be another push. We'll see what happens. Uh, Rob Manfred and, and his predecessor before him, Bud Selig, were ones to not necessarily do that because, in their opinions, it opens a floodgate and a whole bunch of other stuff. So who knows? We'll see. Yeah, like I say, it was just one of the situations he was caught with betting yeah. on baseball as a manager, but he was betting on his own team, yep. so it wasn't his team. And yeah. You know, like I say, it's, it's a very well-known situation yeah. if you're not familiar. I don't want to get into it because I'd rather remember the player yeah. and what he did for the game. And, yeah. and like I say, you can't take anything away from what he did there. Yeah. And like I say, it's just, you know, it's it's a tragedy, like we say, and obviously our condolences out to his family, mm-hmm. friends, and fans all over the world. Mm-hmm. And then switching to the NBA, unfortunately, we do have to start off with a tragedy as well because Dikembe Mutombo. Yeah. Uh, the well-known center um, who just a humanitarian in oh his my own God. right. Too. Yeah, Pl- played a long career. Eight-time uh, NBA All-Star, was All-NBA second team in 2001, two-time All-NBA third team, four-time defensive player of the year, three-time All-Defensive first team, three-time All-Defensive second team, uh, was the NBA all- All-Rookie all first team, uh, was the two-time rebounding leader, three-time block leader. His number was retired with the Atlanta Hawks and the Denver Nuggets. Uh, third team all American with uh with the associated press in 1991 uh when with his career there when he played for i believe it was georgetown uh you know then he was first team all big east in 1991 first second team all big east in 1990 two-time big east defensive player of the year uh finished with uh, over 11,000 points 12,359 rebounds 3,289 blocks i think he's second all time uh, in the nba in blocks but 
like you said, more well known for his humanitarian work that he did overseas. He opened up a hospital uh, in his in his home country. Home country, you know, it was plans for a twenty nine million dollar, three hundred bed hospital on the outskirts of his hometown in the uh, Congolese capital of uh, Kinshasa. Uh, you know, he pl- he personally donated three point five million dollars of his own money towards the hospital's construction. Uh, and the reason he did this is because his mother had passed away without being able to get to a hospital because there wasn't one near her so he's like listen that's not okay we need to fix this yeah and he did that yeah i mean obviously a great player but even a better person and yeah and like i say hearing brain cancer at 58 yeah just, uh, it just yeah heart-wrenching there so you know once again our condolences out to his family friends and fans all over the world mm-hmm. like i say left a legacy that you know few will even come close to and just, one of the greatest commercials i've ever seen oh yes no, no, no. No, no, no. Not today. Yeah, after his blocks, he'd always throw the finger up saying, no, 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 no. Not, no, 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 no. Look look up that commercial if you, if you haven't seen it. Right. So that being said, segueing very quickly into basketball because then we have a very important subject to talk about to close the show. I mean, do we? Oh, we have to talk about the Knicks. Oh, that is, that is a very important one, but I'm saying what you were bringing up at the end is even more important. That's true. So the Knicks made a big move, the one that we've been expecting because it has been reported that they are trading – one Julius Randle and one Dante DiVincenzo to the Minnesota Timberwolves mm-hmm. for Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah. So this is a trade that rocked basketball, and for the Knicks, this is a huge move. Losing Mitchell Robinson, who has been out on injury and uh, is going to be back very late in the season, they needed to fill that role. Mm-hmm. Isaiah Hartenstein, who had been doing the job this past season, has taken off for Oklahoma City, where he got very well paid. Uh-huh. They had a very big need for a center. Julius Randle had, I think, in my opinion, uh, burned his uh, or ran out his welcome. I should say. Yeah. I don't, I don't say burn bridges, but I think it got to a point with him. I don't think the the love affair had really stayed strong. Mm-hmm. And him being injured last year, I think definitely, um, I mean, something out of his situation. But even prior to him in the playoffs was always a situation that him and Brunson were not gelling. Mm-hmm. This is Jalen Brunson's team. Brunson has become the face of the Knicks. Mm-hmm. Vincenzo is kind of a surprise uh, move, but there has been some rumors, and I'll stress rumors, that he did not, he was not happy in New York. Mm-hmm. So it makes more sense to send him to Minnesota. I think this helps out um, Ant-Man very, very much. Because it gives him so much needed help. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he pairs up with Randall. Because mm-hmm. that could be something. Because Anthony Edwards has been an emerging superstar. Their games are kind of the same. Right. But to send Towns to the Big Apple, that's huge. Um, it will not give them a little toughness. Uh, but it does open up a lot on the court. So they will definitely be putting up a lot of points. And let's see how he works with Thibodeau. Because that that's going to be the ultimate test right there. But Carl Anthony Towns coming to the Knicks. I'm going to say right now, I think it puts them up in that Boston talk. Mm-hmm. I think for they have a very, very stacked first five. Bench, debatable. Yeah. But yeah, we'll have yeah, to wait to see yeah. how it all plays out from there. But that being said, before we get out of here, Pad wants to bring up uh, something that's very, very noteworthy. And definitely we want to make sure everybody, if you have the chance to support this, please do. Yeah, so uh, obviously the in the last week since we last recorded, there was a major storm that hit uh, a lot of areas here in the Western Hemisphere of the United States. Uh, hit, hit the Honduras, the Cayman Islands, Cuba, the Southeastern U.S., and that was Hurricane uh, Helen. Uh, it hit at a Category 4 and had its highest winds were measured were at 140 miles an hour. 220 kilometers an hour uh so just absolutely devastating work uh some towns i know in the carolinas and in the tennessee areas are virtually wiped off the off the map uh i know one of the areas that got hit particularly bad was Asheville, north carolina Mm -hmm. you know uh so there's a couple of links in the description of the show to help donate uh one is for the american red cross uh where you can help donate uh relief you can make a donation of of any of any amount uh or they have some select dollar amounts don't to donate there so that'll definitely go to help out folks there there is a gofundme being set up by uh cash wheeler uh from aew with the goal the goal was ten thousand dollars they quickly surpassed that so the goal was moved to twenty five thousand dollars they've more than doubled that at this point because as we currently record the uh dollar amount donated to that and this is for uh hurricane helen relief in western north carolina uh with the do- current dollar amount five fifty one thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars amazing uh some of the do- notable donators with that tony khan has pledged ten thousand dollars chris jericho has pledged five thousand dollars nick jackson two thousand Orange Cassidy, 1500 uh, 
Dax Harwood, uh, his tag team partner there from FTR, has donated $1,000. MJF has donated $1,000. You've also got uh, donations from, uh, I know, Chris Statlander donated some money. Uh, but this one, the description on this says, quote, we are collecting donations to help deliver relief to those affected by Hurricane Helen. After making it to safety up north, I am stocking up a van of supplies to drive back down and deliver it to those in need. There are so many people without access to food, water, or ways out. The damage is devastating and will take years to rebuild. I'll be starting in my home hometown of Old Fort, North Carolina, and the surrounding small towns to help those in need. Any amount helps. Any donations help. It doesn't have to be money, even just a share to help spread the word. Close quote. I did see there was this was posted to the Squared Circle subreddit, and one person who does live in the area says, I said, they, they're they not sure people just understand how bad the destruction was, especially in certain parts of the Carolinas. Where this hit in the Carolinas is 450 miles inland and 2,000 miles above, or yeah, 2,000 feet above sea level. Yeah, this it, is not the, a normal. It, it's uh, never happened in that area's existence. Yeah. It, it's going back as far as hurricanes have been tracked here in the united states the town is absolutely and the whole area is just absolutely devastated i know the new york yankees have made a one million dollar donation to the american red cross uh i know also the wraith nascar race team that michael jordan co-owns or owns or however it works out has donated a million dollars to relief so you've got those going on and then also our buddies over at hops geeks have got a thing going where we've linked to their tweet uh where it does say hey i have a quote hey everyone i'm running a donation drive through my local area to bring non-perishable supplies and clothes and things to get down for Operation Airdrop in Charlotte next weekend uh, of the 12th slash 13th. And there is a link to uh, Matthew Roth, who is on Hopski's uh, mm-hmm. Venmo. So if you send him money, he's going to use that to donate uh, through the local area to help bring him uh, supplies. Because those folks, if you have not seen it, look up the news articles, look up the photos on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, wherever it is, because it is just absolutely devastating and as and as us we've had our fair share of storms come through here oh, yeah. and floodings come through here even i was blown away yeah no it, it's it's astounding i mean and my hearts go out to yeah. everybody that lives in that i mean yeah for somebody that's survived two floods yeah here and i mean they're 100 year old floods yeah like the know, one, once in a once in a hundred years and then it happened again five years later yeah i like i say i i can try understanding what they're going through but especially for where they are they've never experienced it yeah and like I say, it's just if you can go support this, yeah, go support this any way you can. If, Share, donate if you can. Yeah, yeah, you know, the more eyes that can try helping, the better. And that's that's the only thing we can ever ask of anybody. Yeah, so. and, and if you're in this area, we hope you're safe. We hope yeah. you're okay. Hit us up on Twitter. Hit us up on on you know the Facebook on the page. Socials. Yeah. Just, if, if if you need a distraction, if you're just at your absolute breaking point and you you just need five minutes you know, to, to get a distraction and just to calm the nerves or calm, you know, whatever anxiety you got going on, hit us up. We'll, we'll, I will talk anything. We'll, you know, sports, movies, TV, whatever you're interested in. I, if I'm not familiar with it, I'll get familiar and I'll talk with you about it. Absolutely. No, we do have a big contingent down in Carolina. So if anybody down there is, is affected by this and like I said, Pat, Pat hit it right on the head, hit us up, let us know what we can do yeah. to try helping. Like I say, even conversing about any parlay of topics. Yeah. Anything, like I say, if you even want me to talk U.S. agent uh, for the comic stuff, Century, whatever, sure. like, to get a good laugh, I'm down for it. So whatever we can do to help, and just shout out to everybody that's been trying to give some relief to everybody down there. And, you know, like I say, it, it's it's never easy ending shows like this, but, yeah. but you know, we're trying to do our part. And shout out to everybody else who's trying to help out in this time of need. That's it for anything and everything. It is the ODPH. You can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for sports this week. So the one and only Padawan J. Thank you. Thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening. We'll see you next time.